Uh, first of all, thank you, Dr. Stiff, for the kind introduction, and uh, thanks to Leukemia Research Foundation for uh, giving me this opportunity to speak with you. So the task I am given is uh, to talk about chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Over the next uh, 15 to 20 minutes, I will talk to you about what is latest in CLL in terms of our knowledge about the disease as well as the newer treatment options and uh, the logistics behind these new treatment options. In the year uh, 2017, about 20,000 plus cases are expected to be diagnosed with CLL in this country. And among them, more than 80% of them are expected to live for more than five years. That makes it as Dr. Stiff said, the most prevalent adult leukemia in this country. Most patients are diagnosed above 70 years old, the median age is 72, and patients are most often asymptomatic at the time of diagnosis. In terms of prognostic factors, because once you have a diagnosis of any cancer, one of the first questions that is asked is, what is my prognosis? One of the earliest uh, tool that we used is the stage of cancer and in CLL the tool was so called RI staging and that provided us with a very efficient way of telling the patient what is the likely chance of you being alive for this many years. You know at diagnosis you will be able to say that. But over the years especially particularly in the last few years we have so many new prognostic factors, which some of them I am going to show you before we talk about treatment. Now under the microscope, this is what you see in CLL. You have these cells, these lymphocytes, the abnormal lymphocytes, which are increased in number. But again, as Dr. Stiff said in the introduction, under the microscope, this may, many leukemias and lymphomas may seem very similar. So for example, this could be a lymphoma in leukemic phase 2. So therefore, we have to do other tests, not just increase white cells, but other tests like, for example, flow cytometry is a test we do in CLL, which can confirm the diagnosis. Once you have a confirmed diagnosis, the next question is, what is the prognosis? As I said, these are some of the newer prognostic factors. The one you can see on the right side of this slide, CD38 expression is a protein on the surface of the cancer cell that if it is high, it's an adverse prognosis. So also SAP70, the absence of mutation of this particular gene, elevation of this protein in the blood, this chromosome abnormality and these mutations, which you heard some of, the, some of these mutations already from the previous speaker. So these are all considered to be associated with poor prognosis in CLL. Just to show an example, you can see this curve here. This is the patients, percentage of patients who are treated. And if you look at the probability of disease progression, a steep curve means they progress very quickly. This is the time after diagnosis. So if you have a chromosome abnormality, 17p deletion, those patients progress very quickly compared to someone who has this chromosome abnormality they progress very slowly. They may remain without progression for a much longer time. So chromosome abnormalities influence prognosis significantly, as in many other cancers, particularly blood cancers. The so-called ZAP70 protein, if it is present, as you can see here, it gives a poor prognosis compared to patients who don't have that protein on the cells of the cell cancer cells. If you have this mutation, this particular mutation called IGVH mutation, if it is present on the cancer cell, actually those patients do better, which is important to know because many a time mutation is associated with bad prognosis, whereas here mutation of this gene actually is better. So having heard about these prognostic factors, one of the questions that will come up is, well, I have CLL and I have bad prognostic factors. Do I need treatment? Do I need to be treated right away? Well, 
just the presence of these poor prognostic factors alone doesn't mean that you need treatment. You still have to look at if there is an indication for treatment and that we follow this guideline which has been around for a long time. If CLL is causing symptoms, weight loss, night sweats, fever, that's an indication for treatment. Or if the leukemia is filling the marrow and you are becoming more anemic, your platelets are going down, that's an indication for treatment. So these are standard indications for treatment and the poor prognostic factors by itself does not mean that you need to get started on treatment right away because it doesn't make any difference in the long term if you get started treatment right away. Let's look at what are the treatment options for a patient with CLL who is newly diagnosed. If you look at the history over the last 40-50 years, we started with oral drugs like chlorambucil, which is rarely used now. Then came drugs like fludarabine, which is one of the well-accepted chemotherapy drug in CLL. And more recently, particularly in the 2000s, and especially in the last 10 years, you have seen development of a variety of drugs which are more targeted towards the cancer cell. As in any other field in cancer, we are trying to focus our attention on killing the cancer cells without attacking or without the drug or treatment damaging the normal cells. So these are some of the examples of standard treatment options now we have for CLL, like combination of chemotherapy and immunotherapy, like if you give the antibody rituximab with a chemo, that is a form of chemoimmunotherapy. And you have these monoclonal antibodies which target the cancer cells based on the presence of a specific protein on that cancer cell. Alamtuzumab has been around for more than 15 years. Then these drugs like obinutuzumab, commonly called gazaiwa, and ofatumumab, or zera, and ibrutinib and venetoclax, these are even more recently added to the armamentarium we have. And these are oral drugs which are very effective, particularly in certain subgroups of CLL patients, which I'll talk about. So if you have a newly diagnosed CLL and treatment is indicated, these are some of the groups of treatment options. Chemotherapy is still valid. Monoclonal antibodies, as I just mentioned, or combinations of chemotherapy and monoclonal antibodies. For example, the combination called FCR, three drugs, fludarabine and cyclophosphamide, they are chemotherapy drugs. Rituxin is the monoclonal antibody. This is one of the standard chemotherapy, com chemoimmunotherapy combination that we use in CLL. But based on the molecular characteristics of the cancer cell, now we can identify which CLL patient is likely to benefit from this combination the best. For example, if you look at patients who received FCR chemotherapy, which is once in four weeks, you go to the clinic and get the treatment one cycle every month for six months. That's the standard treatment. And the treatment is typically over in six months. And if you look at the outcome, this is the number of months a patient is alive without evidence of disease, okay? If you focus on this curve, the blue curve, if it appears blue there, this curve is on the top, which means these are the patients who are alive for the longest time without any evidence of disease. And these are patients who received six cycles of FCR, but what's the difference between this and the others who have an inferior outcome? Because these patients have the mutation in their immunoglobulin heavy chain, which I just mentioned, the IGHB. So if, if you have mutated gene, and if you receive FCR, in 15 years, you have a 60% chance that there is no evidence of disease. In fact, some of these patients probably are even cured. So I think the emphasis I want to make is that, yes, you can identify which patients are likely to benefit from a particular combination by looking at their molecular profile. Newer drugs like ibrutinib, which is an oral drug, also works very well in these patients, these patients who have this mutation. 
In fact, ibrutinib works equally well in patients who have or don't have this mutation. Then why don't we do that or why don't we use an oral drug compared to going to the clinic and getting an IV drug? Well, the answer is here because we don't know the longer term benefit from these new drugs. We really know about three, probably five years now about how patients do after ibrutinib. They do very well, but we don't have the long-term data like what we did. And of course, ibrutinib is a drug you have to continuously take every day, and it also comes with a set of side effects which we have to be uh, aware of when you select the proper patients. So both of them are options. It's also important to know that some of these new drugs like ibrutinib takes time to get the best response. This is the response as you can see. And the response increases as time goes on. So it is important. It's not like chemotherapy where you may see the response, complete response or complete remission fairly quickly. Here, it may take some months of treatment before you see the response and you have to be patient. Okay, so what if the disease came back? What are the options? Again, you can certainly go for a chemotherapy combination which is different from what you used in the beginning. Or you can use these monoclonal antibodies, again, FDA approved for patients with the relapsed CLL. And ibrutinib and avenetoclax, I just mentioned. There are other options too. I just mentioned some of the ones which are more attractive in terms of their benefit to the patient. For example, venetoclax, again, is an oral drug. It is an inhibitor of a protein called BCL2, which is present in patients with CLL. And you can look at the patients who have this bad chromosome, I mentioned 17P deletion. They are, that's the worst chromosome abnormality in CLL, as I showed you before. The progression is fairly fast. And patients with this chromosome abnormality, they respond, this is the response rate, they respond very well and the response is fairly similar to patients who don't have that mutation. Again, an orally active drug. Stem cell transplantation, you heard a lot about it in the pre from the previous speakers, is an option in CLL also. You have to select the appropriate patients. Autologous transplant, which uh, Dr. Burns elegantly explained the difference between autologous and allogenic stem cell transplant. The auto transplant is typically not a standard of care option for CLL, whereas if a patient with CLL needs transplant, allogenic transplant is the transplant of choice. There are certain patients with CLL in whom allogenic stem cell transplant is standard of care. Just to give you an example, if a patient had a standard chemotherapy regimen like FCR, and I showed you the long uh, curves, but if the patient comes back with disease after FCR in the first year or two, that means this patient has a CLL or tumor cells which are resistant to standard chemotherapy. That's a patient, if the patient is otherwise eligible, should be considered for an allogenic stem cell transplant. You may ask me, what about the new drugs? Yes, you can use the new drugs, but again, you have to remember, we don't know the long term in terms of benefit from the new drugs, whereas stem cell transplant is an established treatment option which has a track record. Another patient with CLL where a transplant should be considered is the patient who has this deletion 17, which as I told you, standard chemotherapy doesn't work very well and even newer treatment options which work very well, we have no idea how long the remission will last. A third group of patients with CLL where a transplant should be considered as standard of care would be the rare transformation. I'm sure you heard about low-grade lymphomas or CLL, which is a low-grade disease typically. But they have a risk of transforming to an aggressive disease. CLL can transform to aggressive lymphoma, we call it Richter syndrome. If that happens, the standard treatment is to give a chemotherapy to put you into remission. But that remission doesn't usually last long. So that's the situation where a transplant should be considered because that ensures the longest remission possible. Well, I don't expect you to read everything in this 
uh, slide, I was only trying to show you there is a lot of new drugs in the pipeline. Not only drugs, but new ways of treating this disease, including the so-called CAR-T therapy, which has been exciting. There are already people have started asking me questions. You can certainly, you know, ask those questions to Dr. Stiff, who is doing this CAR-T therapy as well as transplant, and he can tell you what is the advantage of one over the other. Now, just to give you an example of a clinical trial, which is something I encourage everybody to consider when you need treatment, because clinical trials are the reason why we are talking about all these exciting drugs and exciting way of treating patients. So clinical trial, when, you do, when do you do for a clinical trial? Well, one of the example is if you have a new drug which works better than standard of care drug without unacceptable side effects more than standard of care, that is an indication you should consider a clinical trial. Or if you have a drug that works equally well as standard of care drug, but the side effects are much less. That would be another indication to consider a clinical trial. So here is a combination of drugs. These two drugs are already in the market. These are not clinical trial drugs, these are in the market. Idelalisib is a new drug, is an oral drug, FDA approved for a CLL treatment. And rituximab, I think most people in this hall will know because it's a monoclonal antibody, FDA approved in the market for 20 years. Now this combination, as you can see, works much better than rituximab alone, indicating that this drugs work very well. That is why it is FDA approved. The clinical trial I'm going to show you in the next two or three slides, uses a drug which is in the same class as this drug. The mechanism is the same, but it is superior in some ways and I'm showing, I'm going to show you how. And it also uses a monoclonal antibody which works at the same target as rituximab but has much better activity. So this is the combination or this is a trial. It's a phase three trial which means it's already advanced. These drugs have already gone through the early trials and patients will be randomized either to receive combination of the investigational drug or standard of care. So if you look at the activity of that drug, the oral drug in CLL, this is the activity or efficacy of the approved drug compared to this investigational drug which is more active in the early trials. If you look at the side effects, this drug has certain side effects, particularly it has liver toxicity. You can see it here. Compared to that, the new drug has much lower liver toxicity. Similarly, it can cause inflammation of the colon and diarrhea. Again, as you can see here, this one much lower. So the chance of patients getting out of the clinical trial because of side effect is much less with the new drug compared to the standard drug. So it looks very attractive. You may ask, then why don't we just uh, get that drug approved? Well, these are early trials. Unless the trial is confirmed by a randomized phase three study where you compare the standard, you don't believe the efficacy of the drug. So that is why we are doing the clinical trial where combining that new drug with a new monoclonal antibody, which is looking like in the early trials to be more efficient. So I was just explaining the principles behind clinical trials because that's something we all need to consider. So to summarize what I was talking over the last 15-20 minutes was one, we all know that in CLL, like many other blood cancers, there has been significant improvement, not only in the understanding of the disease, but also our ability to treat these patients with newer drugs and me mechanisms and approaches. And as I said, new treatments, as you heard from other speakers also, are targeting the tumors and tumor cells based on the molecular abnormalities and pathways. And finally, we encourage clinical trials and that is the only reason why we are seeing this development of new drugs. And clinical trials have been successful primarily because of participation, voluntary participation by patients like you over the years and decades. 
and by investigators who were willing and interested and passionate about doing the studies and more important by organization like Leukemia Research Foundation who have been funding these trials over years and decades. So I encourage participation in clinical trial whenever possible. Thank you.